I am a dwarf who lives in the big city. It's called a metro gnome. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I've been working on that one. It's I got to work on my delivery. Thank you so much for showing up. You know, this would be rather embarrassing if I did a workshop and no one showed up and it was just me. So I really appreciate y'all making time on your weekend. We've got a, quite a crew. We've got um, even someone from a, across the pond, John Dorian. I believe you are over in the, in the UK. Holy cow. Go ahead and say hello. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm in the UK, not far from Liverpool. <laughs> That's great. I wish I could say Liverpool with that accent. I love it. Very awesome. Very, what a great crew. Hey, how many of uh, y'all are first time workshoppers? Raise your hand so I know how polite I have to be. Oh, we got four first timers. Okay, you're in for a roller coaster. We get really rough in here. We take off the gloves for sure. And Larry, I'm really glad to see you here. Uh, Larry, say hi, wave. Larry spent a recent tour of duty in the hospital and we're really glad he's back. On, uh, on dry land. So glad you made it, Larry. But it looks like everyone's got a decent connection. Here's my current favorite Zoom joke. <laughs> How long can you stay frozen? You know what's funny? The few times I get my internet frozen, I always am making the most god-awful faces. Why can't I ever do it looking decent? It's really, really kind of embarrassing. But, you know, we're going to jump right into it. The foundation of all of this, as those of you who study with me know, unless you're playing Mozart or on a park bench by yourself, you really don't want to be practicing alone. And that's why I start out this whole, this whole class today with uh, item one. The foundation is do not practice in a vacuum, not literally in a vacuum. By the way, um, this is all for acoustic music. Do you know why... It, uh, electric instruments and vacuum cleaners are similar because they both suck when you plug them in. This is all for acoustic players here. <laughs> and I'm sure if you have some rockers in the crowd, they can, they can forgive that. But the dangers of practicing alone. Item 1A on page 1, we're going to address that real quick because the old model is you go to your lesson, you come back, and you, you devotedly practice by yourself in your little room for an hour. And that actually creates more bad habits than it does good habits. Number one, bad timing. So the problem with reading music notation to get your timing is that it was invented in like the 1400s by old white dudes with poofy white hair and bad eyesight. And everything was played really even. It was designed around basically Gregorian chants. And so the music was like. Very dark and depressing. Everything was even. It's the opposite of jazz. As soon as you get into fiddle tunes and bluegrass and banjo solos and whatnot, all of a sudden we have syncopation. So it's really hard, even if you're a good sight reader, to get syncopation right off the page. That's why I say we want to make sure we learn our timing from the recordings that I provide all, all of y'all in your audio players. If you, when I learned banjo, it was sitting knee to knee with these old timers on back porches. Mostly they knew I was there. And I would copy their timing. That's how I got the tunes. So and then number two under one is no tempo matching opportunity. <laughs> the number one skill, and some of you out there are jammers, you've been playing with friends and jamming and whatnot, you know that no matter how well you know your tune, if you're not matching the tempo of the jam, it's what we call colloquially a train wreck. And all of a sudden you're wondering why you are completed your first verse and everyone is still on halfway through it because you ran ahead like an excited puppy dog. So it's one thing to play in time with yourself, or think you are. It's another thing to match your tempo to something you're listening to. I actually have a phrase for that. I call this the third ear. It's like both of our ears are pretty much designed to focus on our own playing. When you're playing with other people, you have to have that third ear locked on to the jam. And it's difficult. Most of us experience this as first when we practice with a metronome and you keep checking the batteries because you swear it's slowing down. But really, most of us have a, most humans have a natural tendency to speed up the tempo, especially if it's fun and we're excited, like at a jam session. So it takes a lot of time playing along 
with things. It could be your dog's tail on the floor. It could be the sink dripping. I don't care as long as you're matching a tempo. That's item uh, two under one. Then item three is lack of performance stress. So even if you can play perfectly in front of your dog or cat, as soon as you try to match a backing track, you're gonna notice that you're stressed out a little tiny bit because you have to play in time with the track now. Not as scary as when I'm on Zoom staring at you, of course, but uh, it does help to get less nervous over time. By the way, we have a new exercise too it, for making you less nervous. Practice sitting around lots of large rocks. It will make you bolder. I'm really sorry, I'm gonna stop now. I'm done. <laughs> so the, I, the idea behind stress inoculation is whether it's with me staring at you on Zoom or playing along with the track and having to match the tempo, it makes it so your odds of survival are a little higher when you sit around in a jam session, which can get re really chaotic. Now, number four under one on page one is if we practice alone, we don't have the opportunity to work on what I call jam format. And I'll cover that more a little later in the, in the class today. Or jam etiquette, like calling a song, talking about the key, explaining the chords. So if basically you're practicing with a backing track, you can mimic a jam by switching back and forth from your lead part to your backup part, even your uh, improvisation, even your variations. And those of you who work with me know I'm a big fan of when we're practicing to a track, we're acting like we're in a jam session. We're shadow boxing. We, and we kind of have to do this. It's like a, we're all in this weird science fiction movie where we live in plastic bubbles, but we're, we're practicing for when we're out in real life again. So this is all part of the bigger picture because I hope this fall, you all are going to be having your own jam sessions in the backyard with some barbecue and some beer and some banjos and all the B words. And you can be emailing me and let me know how, how great it went because of all the time you spent practicing with your backing tracks. Finally, number five under one, a metronome doesn't count, especially a cheap metronome because you can't count on it. But you don't want to always use a metronome and here's why. A metronome will keep the beat, but it won't let you know if you've got out of sync with the song. You can literally miss out a note or add an extra note in your arrangement and still be in time with the metronome. So that's, it, there's actually some dangers inherent in the metronome. Uh, and also, chords, 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 chords. We'll talk a bit about that more. Chord progressions are king in any song. If you know the chords to a song, you can play the song. And that's why when we talk about the backing tracker a bit later, that's why you want something that has the chords and the rhythm, not just the, the tick-tock of the metronome. So let's go um, on to item B under one. Jamming along. What are the options we have? Well, it's a little more limited than in normal times, but I like to consider it basically being other humans, which are the best, but like once again, we're, we're a little in timeout right now. Uh, and then stereo or media players like iPods or stereos for, you know, the more mature among us. And then we have recording devices, whether it's a, a boom box or whatever, uh, your phone nowadays. And then finally, we have the computer. And you'll notice that the, um, the gist of a lot of this class today is how uh, the most effective we can be in our practicing nowadays, whether or not we want to admit it, is use, utilizing that devilish device, the computer. And this is why we're going to touch on a bit more of that technology in today's group. Um, as much as we hate being on Zoom so much, I wouldn't be able to hang out with y'all right today if we didn't have this technology. So there is some plus sides to it. I have a student that shows up at his lessons. He's in Arkansas, God bless him. And he shows up on the Zoom screen wearing nothing but suspenders. He's glistening with sweat. <laughs> Sometimes a chicken will run around behind him. I'm just really glad you can't smell over Zoom. There's some benefits to this medium for sure. Let's talk about the solution. C under one on page one. Backing tracks. This is really the next best thing, and it smells better, than real humans that you're playing with. There's so many options. Those of you who work with me on the blues knows that we'll go to YouTube and do a key search on slow blues in G, and you have hours of fun with your blues scales. It's so much fun. Let's go to item two, the jam zone. If you have your syllabus printed out, look at the graphic on page three. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a screen share and show that now. Basically, if you have everything in one place, 
<clears throat> when you sit down to practice, your practice sessions are going to be far more effective. So this is on my website. This is the basic idea of the jam zone, as I call it. And as you can see, basically, it's all centers around the computer. And that's number one. You have to have your computer or laptop. By the way, this is a moment for me to scold all of y'all who love to use your cell phones for my lessons with you. First of all, <laughs> then I look really, really small. Second of all, for the love of Pete, try to graduate to a larger monitor. It will make the experience much more realistic. Number two, headphones, because a lot of times there's delay when if you're listening out of your speakers and it goes back into the microphone, you're going to create some delay and it makes it even harder for us to have a conversation without those big delays. Number three is a USB mic over here. Now, that makes my experience better. doesn't really change yours, but some of you all, man, it's like I'm listening through a tinfoil tube with, with a bunch of potato chips in there when I listen to you because it's so crackly and thin and faint. And that's because you're using the onboard mic of your device. There's a lot of cheap mics on Amazon now for like 15, 20 bucks where it plugs right into the USB port on your device and it makes every call you do with anyone a lot higher quality for the audio. Number four, the music stand. Okay, um, that's great because you want to have printouts of your tabs that I'm working with you on so you can take notes when we pick them apart. Number five, we have the instrument stand. I can't tell you the, the pain I've witnessed when someone leaves their instrument against the wall and then bumps into it and that's a big repair job. And then finally, a comfy armless chair. Armed chairs are bad. They get in the way of your free movement. And I'm a big fan of basically as relaxed as we can be, the better. Gravity wins. When I tell my students to pick up their banjo or guitar or mandolin or ukulele, make sure like you're as relaxed as you can be. And in that sense, if you have arms on your chair, it's gonna bump those elbows. So the heart of your jam zone is the computer and our system anyway. Look at item three on page one. Um, basically, well, some people like a small table to put your the coffee on. Uh, do you know why the musician threw their table away? It was flat. So the heart of your jam zone, the computer. <laughs> People are shaking their heads. Uh, get me to a punnery. So the, the big sounds, big sights philosophy is the opposite of the cell phone, okay? We're trying to make this as realistic as possible. So uh, big sights, big sounds. If you have a bigger monitor, you can see what I'm showing you better. And if you have earphones, or earbuds, whatever, headphones, you can hear what I'm playing for you better. So since we're trying to recreate real life on a computer screen, the, the more you see and the more you hear is gonna be better for your jamming and our lesson experiences. Now, number two under three is the problem with Mac. This is getting political. I know I'm gonna catch some flack for this when it goes on YouTube, but the issue, and I'm gonna say it in a nutshell, is that some of my old Mac users, oldsters, Old timeies, OGs are like, well, you can't get viruses. Yes, you can. Macs are now vulnerable to everything. Also, Apple isn't into freeware and open source stuff. And a lot of the stuff I use, including my new backing tracker app, is basically an open source developed app. So that's why if you're trying to use your iPad to access some of my software or any stuff free online, you're going to run into issues. Weird cracklings, issues with click and drag, because... I didn't uh, bow to the great dark one and go through their app store first, so therefore it doesn't work quite well. So there are issues with the Mac devices on most open source software as well as my own. So if you can pick up a used Chromebook or cheap laptop, this is a really good solution. I think in fact, uh, John Dorian, you recently switched over to a laptop and as I understand, it's made your experience much better, has it not? Awesome, see, there we go, testimonial. Now let's talk about item B under three, critical skills. Some of you out there in this class right now know a lot more about computers than I do, for example. Um, you have a lot more information. What does a baby computer call its father computer? Data, of course. You have a lot more data than I do. But my point is even just the basic understanding of how to, how to keep things from crashing will help our experiences. So I get a lot of cute emails from people that are my students that go, oh, this doesn't work and I can't access this and this exploded and there's smoke pouring out of this thing. And I'll say, number one, always reboot your machine. Restart before you call me, then call me. Because that fixes about 80% of stuff is a good old restart, okay? And then internet speed, you know, the old 
If you want less of that, you want to have at least 25, what they call Mbps, megabytes per second. So you can do a speed test on Google just by typing in speed test and it will pop up a free test to test your internet. Um, if you're under 20 Mbps, it's going to be less of a enjoyable experience for us. So if, if you are one of those super slow interneters, think about upgrading at some point. I'm sure Elon Musk and his links of satellites will soon have us along with 5G all hooked up. My beloved old hippie mother believes that uh, 5G is already affecting me because I live six miles from a tower and I'm supposed to like rinse off with sage before I come to the apartment now. Uh, that may be the case. Nonetheless, it is coming. So we will have faster internet soon. Now let's talk about number three under B under three, clearing your image cache. There's a weird thing with computers. And, and once again, my apologies to you techies out there because I'm going to sound like a dummy talking about this. But for you banjo players in the audience, let me put it in simpler terms. Basically, computers in their browser, the thing that we're looking at right now that hosts your internet image, it stores images of sites you visit so it's quicker to load them. However, many websites, including my own, is constantly being updated. So if I put a new something or other in your practice room and you haven't cleared your image cache in like a month, you're going to see an older version of it. So what you want to do is Google how to clear your image cache because it's different for every device. And if you, anything's funny going on, reboot, log out, log back in, clear your image cache. Those are like the... The, the main fixes before you text me at three in the morning. I understand we're on different time zones. Now, updating your OS or operating system, always a good idea, okay? I have a confession, one of my main computers I'm on, in fact, right now is still operating Windows 7. Uh, I'm sure a thunderbolt from the heavens will smite me for saying that. However, most normal humans are on, I think, Windows 10 or 11 now, or, or um, of course, if you're Mac, then you have your own dark voodoo you're doing. But make sure it is up to date because once again, uh, all the software that run, runs my website is constantly being upgraded as well. So they won't match if you're not upgraded. So under the critical skills, always reboot. Make sure you have a minimum of 20 or 25 Mbps. Clear your image cache if monkey business arises and keep your operating system updated. And that should be good so we can interact on Zoom. <laughs> now, Hardware and software, let's talk about that. I recommend that the things that you have sitting around your computer are gonna be the USB microphone, that makes my experience better, and when you start recording yourself, which I want all of you to do more of, having that USB mic's gonna make a way better sound that you hear back, okay? Um, headphones, always good to have, especially when we're talking back and forth. Right now, not a big deal because it's mostly me yapping at you. And then a webcam, of course. And here's the thing everyone forgets, good lighting. Some of my students show up in a dark room with a window behind them and all I see is a ball of light with shoulders. <laughs> it's kind of creepy. So as long as you have the light in front of you, then I can see you at our sessions, okay? Everyone here seems to be very well lit, so that's very nice. Um, now let's go over to the um, computer basics, hardware and software. I'm gonna talk about Item two, recommended software. Once again, this is completely unendorsed. I'm not making money from any of this because I'm an idiot, I should be. But basically the software that I use and I'm really good at, that I can help you with, are the following. If, if you want to record yourself, I use a program called Mixcraft, uh, which works for most computers and I'm really good at it and I can coach you if you wanna start recording yourself. Um, if you're on an iPad or Mac, GarageBand, as much as I like to throw shade on Apple, GarageBand is a great program and really easy to use for recording. And the reason we're gonna talk more about recording because one of the funnest ways you can practice, my friends, is to record a backing track of yourself. Go back, make another track, play along with that. And then you can listen back to see how your tune or improv sounds together with the backing track. It's an invaluable learning aid. It's amazing. So recording is going to be more and more part of our uh, study method, even if we're not making albums or whatever. It's for practice. Okay. So if you do choose to get a uh, mixed craft, hit me up and I'll do some coaching with you on it. And then I use something called Guitar Pro for making tablature. If you want to start writing out tablature, which is a great skill. There's free stuff online. 
But Guitar Pro, is, I think it's a couple bucks. I'm really good at it. Once again, I can help you learn to use it, okay? Let's talk about now the software that I recently put out that most of you are using, but I want to do a little quick tutorial on it um, called the Backing Tracker, okay? So basically, when you go to your practice room, and by the way, I try to practice what I preach. I have my own practice room, so I'm going to show you that right now. I'm learning some funny stuff, but so here's my practice room. Um, hopefully these pictures aren't in the way of the view. Um, so now, basically, so for example, y'all are familiar with this. Th those of you taking lessons with me know that the lessons plan's on the left, the audio's on the right, and yada, yada, yada. Um, in fact, I just recently started learning this gorgeous um, Renaissance piece called My Ladies Carries Dance, and I adapted it for banjo from the original lute, and I'm, I'm practicing it. So when I practice it, I do just like you guys do. I go over here, click on my audio track, And then I can loop sections and I can slow down the tempo if I need. But that's not the discussion here. The discussion here is the backing tracker. So when you click on this link here, you should all be seeing this backing tracker interface. Let me make sure with a double share. Okay, good. So there's a tutorial here of how to use this. Click help and it'll give you a basic rundown. But basically, anytime you're practicing something, you want to be utilizing this to practice along with. Like I said earlier, it's a chord flavored metronome. So if I'm gonna play uh, licks going from G to C, all I do is go down here, I drag up a G chord, I go down here and click and drag up a C chord, and then I click my space bar, lo and behold, I got my G lick, got my C lick. So whether you're doing arpeggios, Or Scruggs Licks, here's the C. Having not just the click, but the chords is revolutionary for how it's going to cause you to practice. This is huge. So you really want to be using that whenever you're doing anything involving switching from one thing to another, which is a lot of musical practice, okay? So basically the, the backing tracker is something that we want to be employing, not just for songs, but for techniques as well. And if you have questions about that, get a hold of me. I'd be happy to spend extra time with you coaching you through that. But nowadays, I never sit down and do a scale or an arpeggio or a lick without that running because I want to hear how I'm matching the chords, okay? Later on, when we get into advanced improvisation, I think I'm doing that with some of you. If I'm playing G to C, on the one level, you're gonna go G, C, but real soon, we're going to be employing scales. So you want to be hearing how your notes are matching with the chords underneath you. That's the whole magic of improvisation right there. Let's talk about your practice dashboard under five, under four at the bottom of your page. Um, basically, if, if you have everything in one place, I don't ultimately care if you're using my system and my practice room and my backing tracker, as long as everything's in one place. When you sit down, because a lot of you, and it's kind of fun to watch, you're running over here and grabbing a notepad, running over here and grabbing a pick. Everything's like all around your house. So if it's in one little zone, then we spend more time playing and less time scampering about. Let's go over to um, the bottom of page one, the itemized practice list. Okay, so now what this is, is what I call your lesson plan. Those of you who study with me on Zoom know that when we log in, and I've, in fact, some of you actually have recently confessed you rarely do log in, but start logging in more because that's your numbered, itemized list of things that you and I have determined we need to practice. So we're not sitting out there gazing out the window, noodling for a couple of minutes and going making a bowl of cereal and then going playing in the garden. Okay, I know some of us can relate to this. We have to have that itemized list. It's very important for effective practice time. Now, the last item on page one is audio tracks for everything. I have a pet peeve. I love all my fellow music teachers. I'm, I'm friends with Banjo Ben. He's awesome. Uh, Jim Panky. And here's my Jim Panky impression. <laughs> love that guy. But, but, but some of these fellows, uh, some of my fellow teachers could probably get a little more practiced in recording everything. So giving someone a tab without a recording is a dangerous proposition. Like Pete Seeger called it, it's a bunch of hen scratch and fly specs. 
It looks like someone took a shotgun, loaded it full of watermelon seeds, and shot it at a blank canvas. It's, it's pointless unless you could listen to the recording of it. So whenever you all are studying with any other fine music teachers out there, demand that they record the tab for you. Uh, and and it's, it's not much to ask. Let's go to page two of our outline. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the importance of audio. Not just for listening anymore. Timing, like I said before, written notation is deceptive as heck because it was designed for classical music, when everything is like a... There's not a lot of syncopation in Baroque music. That's not the point. Everything's nice and even. As soon as you get to jazz... And there's all these syncopated, anticipated, tiny bit quicker, tiny bit later notes. Musical notation has to resort to ties, eighth rests, and all these funny looking scribbles to mimic syncopation. When I first started learning jazz, I would listen to the recordings to get the timing. And I found that that's the best way to complement your tablature or score is listen to the recording for the timing. Don't try to count that sit. One-y and a two-y, we should be way beyond that. We should be listening and mimicking what we hear. Now, um, then, matching tempos. That's the jam skill. If you can match a tempo with the recording, you're one step closer to having a great time playing with your friends and family because you can stay in time with them. Okay? Then we have memorizing. Here's a really interesting experience I had recently because my memory isn't my best quality. I did a, a, a blind test result where I timed how long it took me to memorize a fiddle tune off the page and then how long it took me to memorize that same fiddle tune or a similar fiddle tune by listening to it and not looking at any paper. And the ear method was faster than the eye. And that should make sense. This is music after all. It's designed for these two organs, okay? And the heart, of course. But you want to memorize by listening, not studying the tablature. That's a huge breakthrough I've recently had. <laughs> Try it, you'll be surprised, it's faster, okay? And then finally, jam format. When we're practicing our tunes, we don't want to fall into the trap that so many people do with other instructors where they get the lead part all dialed in and fast and clean, and they don't learn the backup part. And then they wonder why they don't get an email asking them back to the next jam because they played a banjo solo the whole time. And even the most avid banjo aficionados don't necessarily want to hear the solo the whole time because there's other players that want to step forward and have their turn. So that's another reason for audio tracks is to practice your backup playing. Now, under two, top of page two, audio controls. There's two powerful tools that we recently introduced with Jamalong. You wanna be able to control the tempo and you wanna be able to loop sections. Any audio format that, you, that you're using, whether or not it's mine, if you can slow it down and then loop certain sections, you're far ahead of the game. You have complete control over that audio track. And anybody learning a complex piece right now, and I see a bunch of you that are, if, I, if I'm playing something that, that's giving you some trouble, and I wanna go, ooh, that four fret stretch, I will loop this part right here, I'll go. you have the ability on your audio player in your practice room to click that little arrow when start the loop and click the little arrow and end the loop. Now, if you, I haven't told you about this feature yet, I'm sorry it's brand new, bring it up at our next Zoom session or practice in your practice room and email me or call me this weekend and let me know how it's working for you because using the looper is really important for tough sections when you're learning a challenging piece. The bottom line is, any audio format you're using should have tempo control and a looping ability. That puts you head and shoulders above the rest, okay? Um, now we have the importance of, okay, the online metronome. I do have that. That's four at the top of the page. The dangers of the metronome, I briefly talked about that. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but basically a metronome is just giving you a beat. It's not telling you if you're playing the right notes over the chord. It's not telling you if you missed out a note or added an extra. It's, it's not telling you a lot. And a lot of those things are super important when you're playing with human beings. So backing tracks, trump, metronomes every day of the week, okay? 
Now, let's talk about under uh, item five, we have the backing tracker. We went over that, but I want to cover another couple things. Um, the things you get out of playing with that app and hearing the chords, correct timing, we went over that. Faster memorization, it gets in your brain quicker, okay? And then of course we have developing your third ear. You're listening to yourself and the thing, super important. And then we have a, a, an opportunity for you to work on your improvisational skills. So next time you sit down, make just a G to C. Just two bars of G, two bars of C. And then play rolls. Those of you learning scales, play your G scale. Just the, just the scale. And listen to how the mood and the emotion of the scale changes when the C chord emerges. It's fascinating. This is something jazz musicians call playing the changes. And it means that it's like the chords are this, um, this valley and we're improvising. We're like a, a hawk gliding on the currents over the valley. And as the valley changes, we change to match it or we change to be opposite. We, we interact with the terrain of the chord progression. That's so important to get into your noodles, man. And that's why playing along with the backing tracker will give you opportunities with no one listening to experiment with that, okay? So let's, and that's why I call it a chord flavored metronome. Now, a couple more skills, under five on page two. Um, jam shadow boxing, okay? This is the fun part. Switching from backup to lead and variations and improvisation, okay? So those of you who have a practice room with me know that your tunes have four check boxes. Number one, the chords. If I'm playing boil them cabbage down, the first thing I wanna have is G, C, G, D. That's the most important part. That's how you're gonna support your other jammers. The second check box is your lead. The third check box says variation. That means where we learn to move up the fingerboard and do the same thing up here. We've worked something out up the fingerboard that we have in our back pocket we can pull out at the next jam circle. It's called a variation. It's not improvising, it's pre-planned. The final check box in your song list says improv, meaning now we can string our licks together we can play scales, we can do whatever we do on our given instrument to play off the cuff by the seat of our pants. Granted, that's terrifying for, for a lot of you. That's why you do it in front of your computer with a glass of whatever and run that backing tracker so no one else has to hear you do terrible things to the chord progression. But that's how you get better, okay? So now we're talking about, I believe, item two under five, learning spicier backup. This is something I want to start working with y'all more because if you play backup 70% of the time, we don't want to get bored. Well, guess what, my friends? Backup's one of the most fun things you can do on your instrument. <coughs> By the way, I'm holding a banjo on this class because I don't want to grab a ton of stuff and spend my day running around grabbing instruments. But everything I'm talking about for the banjo also applies to musical instruments, okay? It's, it's across the board. So spicier backup means adding the following elements to your playing. First of all, and you might want to take notes of this. First of all, inversions. You want to have several ways to make each chord, my friends. So important. G, 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 G. C, C, C. The first thing we add is inversions. The second thing we add is bass lines. It's not just the bass that plays bass lines. How many bass players does it take to change a light bulb? One. Five, one, five, one, five. <laughs> Hopefully, in a good jam. Actually, none of them, they can't get up that high. So here's an example of my banjo playing a bass line going from G to C. Here's my G. Watch how easy this is. That took me up to C. I'm gonna walk back down. I'm gonna walk down to D. Fret by fret. So after you learn several ways to make each chord inversions then you want to put bass lines in between the chords okay and finally we add what are called passing chords we want to put sevenths in between 
are chords as well. A seventh is like a spicy, more disturbing, somewhat tense sounding chord. Here's G. Here's G7. It has that stepped on cat note in there. That's designed to build tension to want to pull us to the next chord, which is almost always a fourth higher in most of Western music. Um, so if I'm going from G to C, it's funner and more spicy to go G, G7 to C. Okay, same if I'm in G and I'm, I'm at the five chord, I'm on D. Before I come back home to G, why not go D, D7, then G. See, and you'll hear in Beatles music and pop and a lot of rock and roll, you'll hear those sevens come in right before the chord change. Okay, finally in your spicier backup list, we want to add what are called fill, F-I-L-L, -L, licks. These are little phrases that we put at the end of the vocal phrase like an exclamation point. Okay, we, all you banjo players have heard this classic. If you don't know that one, remind me to teach it to you in our next Zoom lesson. That's the ultimate exclamation point to put in after any vocal line ends. Uh, let's say I'm going coming around the mountain. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming around the mountain. She'll be coming around the mountain. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. It's part of the fun in folk and bluegrass and even country and rock when we're sitting around playing these tunes. It's allowed and even expected to put those exclamation points in. And everybody can do them. It's, 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 a, it's a neat practice. And it's like a super micro lead part for you where you get to play like a measure and then duck back under the chords. So it's a, another good way to start accustoming yourself to, to just a nanosecond of the spotlight. And it sounds better. So that, I believe, was under spicier backup. Now let's talk about, I'm going to skip to C under five, transposing and expanding your key repertoire. Another reason for using the backing tracker is the instant transposing that we have available to us, okay? So let me do another quick screen share and show you how I like to practice by transposing. So under all saved songs, by the way, is the library that all my wonderful students have been adding songs in here and it's getting bigger and bigger and it's exciting. Um, but let's say we have, um, you're gonna play, let's see, oh gosh, there's some cool stuff in here. Maple Leaf, Maple Leaf Rag. Okay, Old Home Place. Boom. So that's a common bluegrass song. It's been 10 long years since I left my home. The hollow where I was born. Okay, now, let's say they're playing it in the key of um, B. Some people like to jack this song all the way up to B. You're going to go find it in your backing tracker, go to the key drop down, and choose the key. Boom. The software knows all the chords for the new key, so you can transpose it to any key you want, okay? And then practice it in the new key. So this also helps with the capo. The capo is kind of a conundrum because as soon as you put a capo on, the chords you're physically making don't match the chords the other people without capos are physically making, although the key is the same. So that that's kind of, we've, I've seen some jams go off the road and burst into flames because some of the capo was calling the chords they were physically making. <clears throat> they need to practice their transposing. So now we're talking about <coughs> a D under five speed training. How do you get faster? Now, first, a quick disclaimer. There's no real musical value in playing really fast. You know what I mean? I spent some of my misguided youth trying to enter contests. And, <laughs> and I can play fast, but to me, that's not as fun as doing this. Playing something slow and groovy. That has way more enjoyment for those around us as well. So that disclaimer being said, a lot of bluegrass does push us. They say there's three tempos, slow, medium, and bluegrass. And so to get to those, you need a way to practice speed training. This is a terrible metaphor because I don't work out anymore. But way back in the day when I did, I know that you would keep track of how much weight was on your thing, okay? Uh, so you could maybe Increase it a tiny bit. The same with speed training. So the next time you're at your backing tracker, go up to the upper right, click it a couple clicks faster, see if you can hang 
If the wheels fall off, no big, go back to where you were. But you have to be able to push yourself every now and then. And that's why we need these, these audio tracks to do that. Otherwise, you're stuck with a metronome and then you have a well-dressed dwarf hanging around and it's awkward. So that's one of the ways we get faster is by tracking our BPM or beats per minute on the backing tracker in the upper right, okay? Really important for speed training. Now, let's talk about, I believe we are at E under five, adding your own songs. I'd like to playfully assign all of you to add a couple of your own chord progressions in the backing tracker and then email me or text me or call me and let me know how your experience went. Because when you learn more about music, you wanna create your own. You wanna make up chord progressions. I did a workshop on composing recently unlike Bach and Mozart, I believe they're decomposing. But we talked about, it's not about a bunch of notes, okay? It's about making chords that sound good together. Here's my G. What if I go to E minor? What if I then went to C? And then I went to F. Oh, I like that, that's, un that's unique. String chords together, just Write out the alphabet and throw a pencil at it. Be random. But then go ahead and go to your backing tracker and put those in and listen to it and play along and experience being a composer because you just wrote a song. If you can string chords together, you wrote a song. By the way, if you haven't got my chart called The Chord Families, next time you're on Jam Along, go to the resources page, then the charts page, and then there's a scroll down, there's something called Chord Families and it shows you all the chords that sound good together is a great starting point, okay? <clears throat> the circle of fifths does that as well, but it's also very confusing and, and actually wrongly named. It's supposed to be called the circle of force, but we'll talk about that another time. I, I only wanna stir up so much controversy today. So now we're talking about um, harmonic composition, G under five. So the chord families chart is, is uh, number, number one there, and then number two is the circle of fifths. Ask me to explain that on, on our next lesson. Now let's go over to, um, Item six on page two, this comes from about 30 years of teaching. I found there's four stages that you wanna get a song from the page into your brain. Number one is the tab phase or the score, whatever, the, the notation or tab, I don't care, but you're picking through the piece note for note, doing painful things to each note as you encounter it and making it so you can slowly get through the page, okay? That's the rough stage, that's the tab phase. Then we have the audio track. You go over to your audio player, you click it really slow, and you play along with me. Now all of a sudden that's gonna cement your timing. If you don't do that phase, you're gonna go to the jam and your timing's gonna be all out of whack. So you really, after you learn the tab, don't wait, go right to the audio, click it slow, play along, okay? Then we have the backing track or backing tracker. I don't care if you go to YouTube and get a backing track, whatever. But then as soon as you can play along with the audio of the lead part, then take off the training wheels and go to the backing tracker and then you're the only lead part. You don't hear me anymore, you have to hold that up. And that's very important because now you're playing the lead and there's no one else supporting you except the backing track, okay? And then finally we have jam format. After you've got to where you can play Boil Them Cabbage Down. to the backing tracker, then I want you switching back and forth from your backup part to the lead. And if you have a variation, throw it in. If you feel good about improv, throw that in. But now you're shadow boxing with that backing track, just like you would be doing in a real jam session, okay? We're all kind of fake it till we make it right now, boys and girls, and, and then when we come back out swinging, it's gonna be great because of all this great work we put in, playing as if we are jamming, trust me, okay? So now we wanna talk about uh, item seven, the philosophy. We're gonna end today's class with talking about the philosophy that I've developed with all of you. And by the way, thank you, because I would not have came up with this stuff if it weren't for all you wonderful friends and students of mine that helped me find ways of teaching and playing that were not drudgery, and hopefully we don't dread. Some of you all still probably slightly dread me showing up and listening to you but it's good for you because it's causing stress inoculation. If you can play in front of me staring at you, then you can play in front of any jam, okay? It's gonna be easier, trust me. <sighs> so the philosophy is less vinegar, more honey. <clears throat> less, 
less discipline, less guilt, less hard work, less goal setting, more enjoyment, more leisure. For the love of Pete, especially in these times when you open the door or turn on the TV and you're just like, oh my God, I'm shutting both of those right now. <laughs> so we need our instruments to, to be instruments of joy, things that make us happy when you sit down with this thing on, okay? That's the less vinegar, more honey approach. Now, under that, less is more. This is probably going to catch some flack from other instructors on YouTube. I, I do get uh, challenged now and then because of the controversial stuff I say, but I'm going to go ahead and say this. Lower your expectations. I doubt if very many of you have a giant concert you're preparing for. If you do, I apologize. But I don't even have a concert I'm preparing for right now. So I've lowered my expectations. My practice sessions are about me having a good time. They're not about getting ready for my recital. Okay, that's even a terrible word. You want to lower your expectations. When I first started going to the recording studio, I was a nightmare. I would play a part like 20 times because I wanted to get it 100%. One day, light bulb, in my mind, I thought, I want to get 70%. Life became so much more enjoyable. I was just shooting for 60, 70%. And everybody loved it because I wasn't so darn tense about it. Okay. And, and being tense is our, is our worst enemy. Those of you who've got my book, Banjos in Babylon, <clears throat> it's no joke. I was so tense that I actually chipped a piece off my tooth practicing banjo as a kid. <laughs> and so that's when I had to think through this and go, I got to relax. This is, and no song is worth breaking parts of your body over. I don't care how great it sounds. So now let's talk about, <clears throat> under the philosophy, <clears throat> less is more, shorter sessions. Another myth, practicing singing for an hour is good for you. No, it's not. It's bad for you, and it's also bad for the relationships of your loved ones and family. Practice for like five minutes. Then go do something else that has nothing to do with music. Then come back. Practice for another five or ten minutes. Then go do something else. There's a method that's gaining popularity called the Pomodoro or Pomodoro method. Pomodoro, I guess, is the Italian term for a tomato, I think because this guy invented this timer for musicians that looked like a tomato and you would clock it so you could only practice for like five or 10 minutes and you had to take a break. There's actually online groups that do the Pomodoro together now. That's so true, man. Burnout is the big risk you take if you try to go 40 minutes practicing. That's for marathon people or like classical violin players. <laughs> we wanna have fun doing it. <clears throat> and you know the difference between a violin and a fiddle they're exactly the same, except you're allowed to spill beer on a fiddle. We have more fun. It's folk music. Now, um, back to the philosophy. We talked about lowering the bar, shorter sessions, <clears throat> and I call it enjoyment over progress. Progress will happen. You focus on having a good time. Don't focus on progress. That's like a centipede trying to figure out how it walks. You're going to get all tangled up. Just focus on having a good time, and progress will happen as naturally as the sun comes up. This is, this is just like a, a truth that's been around for like millennia. Um, so that's what I call um, basically enjoyment over progress. And then, of course, we have the guilt-free zone. When you sit down in front of me on Zoom, don't have any desire to show me your accomplishments. I just want to catch up with you and have a good time. I know that over time, you're going to have the progress. So we're focusing on enjoyment. It's like a psychological trick we have to play on ourselves and that's how we get rid of guilt, um, which is a whole nother rabbit hole. Now, let's talk about B under seven, whole brain practicing. Man, I, I wish I should do a whole class on this because this is brain science. Whether or not you believe that we have two hemispheres of our brain and one is more creative and one's more intuitive, let's assume that's the case and that we have a creative side and a logical side that are very different. You need both when you practice, my friends. So after you get done practicing something difficult, like when I sit down, I'll do a technique that I find difficult. I'll do an arpeggio. And I'll do maybe three or four minutes of that. I'll stop, go water my house plants, and then I'll sit down and now I'll shift over to my creative and I'll only noodle around and have fun and gaze out the window and just do whatever I want for a little bit. 
You're literally moving the energy from one side of your brain to the other when you do that. And they're both critically important. Being creative and being able to improvise allows us to have some of the most fun you can possibly have with your instrument. Being technical and left brain is good too. That's about playing clean and accurately, but that's certainly not more important than being creative and having a great time making up stuff on the spot. So when you sit down to practice, remember, noodling and goofing off and spacing out is equally important to focus practice. I know I'm gonna catch some crap on line for that, but it's true and I said it. They're both important, okay? So that's what I call whole brain practicing. Now, C under seven, two steps forward, one step back. If we can't accept plateaus and breaks, we're in for a miserable life with our instruments. So what I mean by that is we're gonna hit plateaus where we don't progress. It could be months at a time. Accept it. Bela Fleck has spoke to that, man. He said, sometimes I'll practice for a month and actually get a little bit worse. <laughs> he, he, made, he made that comment. And so I'm like, yes, that's awesome. Breaks meaning sometimes you won't play your instrument for a week, maybe a couple of weeks. I hear like, like gasps of horror here, maybe a month or two. That's called taking a break. It doesn't mean you failed and you're never gonna pick it up again. It means you're taking a gall darn break and your brain needs that. So plateaus are when you don't progress and breaks are when you stop. If you accept those as part of the learning process, you're not gonna pawn your instrument. Okay, we have to accept the whole picture. We can't always get the cake, okay? Like the Russians say, sometimes you get the bear, sometimes the bear gets you. Sometimes you sit down and practice and you get a little worse. Laugh about it, go have a glass of wine and watch Netflix. Wave the white flag. You have to know when to walk away and fight again another day. That's so true with music, man. So that was my, my uh, two steps forward, one step back theory. And then D under seven, always play to something, man. I mean, like I said, I don't care if it's your dog's tail on the floor. If you're playing to something, your focus is now on matching the universal heartbeat. It's not on, oh my gosh, I keep making that note sound buzzy. So we shift our focus to being in sync and not being too detail oriented. Now we're on to number eight, toward a new teacher student model. No more church lady. Who's seen that skit on SNL? It's an old skit, Dana Carvey. Yeah. I mean, basically so many teachers resemble that and they're waving a ruler at you and they're basically instilling guilt. I would say about 80% of my students who suffer from, from like anxiety and, and guilt and, and, and issues with our lessons are because of some church lady back there. So my, my theory is to be the opposite of the, opposite of the church lady. Number one, expectations are your worst enemy. Probably true in life, but I'm not doing a philosophy course. I'm going to stick to music. But if you expect to sit down for a half an hour and, and get a lot of progress, you're setting yourself up for a fall. <sighs> try this. <clears throat> try to have a practice session next time or try to have a lesson with me next time and literally make an effort to have zero expectations. Expect nothing from it. You'll surprise yourself. You'll have some enjoyable times. Imagine that. So I say the enemy number one, other than the church lady, is expectations. That's our own inner church lady yelling at us and waving a ruler. You did not practice enough. No, this is the opposite of that, okay? And then B under eight, the cult of progress. Oh my gosh. I have lost more students than I care to count. And it's not because of me. I think I'm a good teacher because they thought that if they showed up for a couple more lessons and they didn't learn that piece than that they failed. And so guess what their solution was? To quit. Oh, that's a great solution. If you think you're failing, just quit entirely. That's not gonna help. That's like saying, I'm afraid of drowning so I jump off the boat. Take a break, accept the plateau, do something else for a month or whatever, and then come back and let's shoot the breeze. There's really no cause Put those kind of expectations on yourself. You don't, and by the way, boys and girls, just so you know, I practice what I preach. I'm taking lessons from two people right now, including Ryan Cavanaugh, great banjo player, and some standard jazz people. I'm working with people on jazz wire and I love them and they're tough. And so if I think that I have to learn that Charlie Parker lick before I come back to the group, 
I'm, I'm setting myself up for, for a bad day. That'll happen eventually. I just want to have fun with my fellow humans. So that's the main thing. You do not need to have accomplished anything before your next lesson. Okay, put that on your refrigerator. Print that out. Make a t-shirt. That's the mantra. That's so important, okay? And now we have C under eight at the bottom of page two. Qualities of an evolved music lesson. Here's what we want to have together, my friends. When, you, when I meet any of you on Zoom, and hopefully one day in real life, because I still want to have a music camp someday and I believe it'll happen, here's what we want to be experiencing. Enjoyment. We want to have a good time. We want to be entertained by each other, tell stories, whatever. You know, how's it going? I want to inspire you. That comes from the Latin inspiritus, to be in the spirit together, okay? It's not even a religious thing. It's a thing of being inspired together. That's my main goal. It's therapeutic. We, we, we whine and complain together. We talk about how we just can't get this part. And I'll share failure stories anytime. I love failure stories. And then we also want it to be encouraging. You encourage me when you show up. That means you're still going to stick in there. I encourage you. And so it's a mutual win-win. And we want to have a darn good time. That's the bottom line here. If we're not having a good time, we should be getting paid a lot. And uh, since most of us aren't getting paid to play, we need to be having fun to play. There's only two reasons we should do pretty much anything in this world. We're getting paid or having a good time. Or it's good for us, I guess. There's that too. Uh, so the bottom line here is if you use the technology we covered today and you combine that with a positive attitude and no expectations and being watchful for guilt and anxiety when you encounter plateaus and breaks, then you're going to accomplish all of your musical dreams without even trying. It's going to happen to you. It's just going to happen to you while you're having a good time. What a great deal is that? That should be the only method that we're using to learn music. And uh, I really appreciate all of you being here today. It really made my day. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope all of you have a wonderful and music-filled weekend. And I will see you all at your next class with me. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for showing up. Have a Thank great you. weekend. And have fun, okay? See you all soon.